One of the most wonderful things about a classical school is how we embrace building the imagination. Let's play a game, Lev. Let's play We're in Ancient Egypt. For our students, um, I've noticed they are so creative. I'm the Tigris. I'm the Re Euphrates. Okay. And so able to, to draw pictures, to compose poems, to write essays, and it's because they're given really rich material to think about. Questions everyone asks, but then also stories from history, from literature. We'll read our, our Greek storybooks, um, and a lot of times uh, I'll have them, there's not illustrations in all these books, so we'll talk about the main concepts of the story and I'll have them illustrate uh, whatever the event is. That, that the main the main concept of that story, and so a lot of them will say, "Well, I don't know what to draw," and I try to urge them to use their imagination and think back about what we read, and to illustrate something that they are imagining in their minds. If you see young children being exposed to ways they can open up their imagination to what's true, good, and beautiful, you will see it's a real delight following the curriculum all the way up, because as Catholics. We know we're called to enter into the nuptial mystery. In other words, we know we're called to this relationship with Jesus, our bridegroom. And unless we prepare the kids to enter the world of the unthinkable, it's extremely difficult to do that. So one of the things I'm most proud about at our school is we open up the children's imagination through art, through literature, through so many different things so that they're ready to embark upon this adventure as they become young adults. And this way, when they make their, their confirmation or they start discerning if they're called to the religious life or the married life, they already are open to the possibilities. You know, some things that are very unique about our school is the importance of poetry and memorization. This, the kids really love it. They light up when they recite their poetry. Poetry represents the futility of language because even the most talented poet is never going to truly capture the essence of what they're describing and make it truly present to the reader. It's kind of a grappling with the inadequacy of language within an artistic medium. And sometimes all it can do is give a shape or form to the soul's outcry, whether of a high sorrow or a profound joy and it gives us a certain comfort to know that past generations before us have already grappled with these questions and have found a phrasing for them. It's, Gather ye rosebuds while ye may, old time is still flying. And the same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. What's really inspiring for me is um, the poetry here, when the students are reciting it together, you understand what most cultures understood that we only understand very little of now and that's because most cultures had a shared body of literature that they didn't really know by reading but they knew orally and so when you hear 17 students reciting a poem together and all of them are taking delight in it they're sharing it maybe the poem teaches something from Aesop's fables or it teaches them how to behave. It's just really wonderful to see. And so I think the lower school teachers do a great job of preparing them and then we take that on and they grow in their appreciation of poetry in the upper school as well. If we shadows have offended, think but this and all is mended, that you have but slumbered here, while these visions did appear. When society loses its sense of awe and wonder and its belief in the existence of something sacred and beyond man, the perceived need for poetry declines because poetry is as a high art a response to these things. In one sense poetry is kind of a representation of the power of language because it's a participation in the divine creative act and an arrival at the essences of things. It's fulfilling man's place in the creation hierarchy and is also an imitation of God which fulfills man's nature as a creature created in the image and likeness of God. I'd like to talk about the word imitation and what it means for a classical education. 
in um, in classical pedagogy we use the word mimesis which in Greek means imitation and the classical um, program is actually the only type of education that really emphasizes this to students and if you study scripture and church history you see that actually imitation is the way human beings were made to live to their full potential one of the things that we do in the classical curriculum is we try to appeal to the noble we try to appeal to virtue and for boys in particular they um, naturally take to that that's not appealed to in modern education and I think that we try to really look at character education but specifically character education by looking at noble or courageous or virtuous examples from history and from literature we try to emphasize that and to call students to their highest and noblest aspiration. For first grade we, we learn about Greek studies. So we study um, the Odyssey and the Iliad and a couple of those stories that we've already read they still remember those from the beginning of the year and they'll probably remember those for the rest of their lives. We don't shy away from studying wars and battles. In the ancient year we studied Horatius at the bridge and we study how he held off the enemies who are trying to enter Rome. So we really try to look at that and um, we don't try to whitewash history but we do try to tell our boys, our students, all of our students that you come from a great history, you're part of a great nation, you should be proud of your nation, you should be proud of Western civilization, you should be proud of your Catholic faith. And we also see that in a lot of the boys serving on the altar. They're willing to serve, they're willing to sing in the choir and they're they give of themselves to the school and also to St. Vincent de Paul and so I think that's a really great part of our school that especially through Father Granito's influence they are willing to do that. St. Paul said I imitate Christ so imitate me and so we know that if you look at the full meaning of Christ's incarnation and the full revelation of God to human beings we are called to imitate Christ. And so the way we do that in education is we look at what's true, good, and beautiful, and we imitate it. So for example, at our school, we use uh, the Institute for Excellence in Writing for our writing program. And that program is built on imitating great writing. In moments of crisis, it consoles us to have the words ready at hand when we're faced with the inadequacy of our own everyday language. Um, and you can see this in Christ himself in his unspeakable agony on the cross. He turns to the words of the Psalms and sacred poetry in order to give voice to his torment. And so what we do is we build this foundation. We see this very much also in our art program where students imitate what the masters have done. So when students spend years and years imitating what's already been proven to be true, at that point, they are able to discover what their own gifts are. And part of the problem in modern education is we ask kids to express themselves and discover these gifts when they're much too young and haven't fully taken in all that um, the Catholic heritage has to offer. So we're really excited about that word imitation here at Holy Child.